All right, so I am the uh, MC and co-presenter tonight, so I will be glad to kick things off. I'm Cindy Van Curen. I'm the president-elect for OPA, uh, and I want to welcome all of you to our second telepsychology forum this week. On behalf of OPA, we have really appreciated the thoughtful, respectful, and helpful discussions on the listserv, um, emails, phone calls, and so forth, particularly those related to this abrupt change uh, over to telepsychology. The, te the transition's been abrupt and uncertain for many, and um, in response to the questions that folks have and the phone calls to OPA, we decided to put together these, um, these, these two forums. Um, and so a, a huge thank you to Jim Broyles who has worked tirelessly to gather the information which is changing hour to hour and um, for, for volunteering to facilitate these two forums. Um, as you know, both of the forums sold out in a matter of hours showing how interested folks are in this material. Um, we're going to keep rolling out different forums based on the patterns that we're seeing on the listserv, the need and the availability of uh, leadership or other volunteers. So for example, today registration opened for a wellness forum this Thursday that is free to both members and non-members. Uh, in another day or two, we're going to post a forum for Sunday about uh, social justice issues and how we can care for our folks who with food insecurities and all the other things that we're worried about. Um, we appreciate everyone's patience and conscientiousness in protecting our psychology community, our professional communities, and our personal community. I'm gonna I, do just I a believe, little bit of housekeeping. Yes. I, believe that, I just believe that we're gonna probably gonna be doing another one of these on Tuesday night. I don't know if that's been oh, solidified good. yet. Michael's saying yes. So we're gonna do one next okay, Tuesday perfect. Night, like this one. Um, because so many people are signing up. What I'm asking is then, if you are a part of this one, don't sign up for the next one. You'll be doing pretty good with just looking at the continued written updates uh, that I will send out after this, but pass the word for the ones in the future. Next Tuesday Thank night. Thank you, Jim. I didn't know that I appreciate that. And I'm also working, we've had a lot of folks just asking questions about sort of the practical elements of telepsychology. So I'm trying to find, um, a co-facilitator so that I can just start a supervision group with folks that just have questions about the, the ins and outs and you know the the technicalities and and how to help folks who can't hear you very well adapt to tele telepsychology and so forth. All right, just a couple housekeeping issues. If you are new to Zoom, please consider adding uh, the participation by video option. Just makes for more convenient or I'm sorry, more meaningful conversation. It also gives you the option to actually see the chat that's going on um, as well. Uh, Michael's got us all muted and um, I'm sure he'll let us know what, how you can get our attention if you want to be unmuted to make a, a question uh, or think, comment. I think they can go ahead and unmute themselves. And oh, okay. what we, kind of what, what, what we'd like to do with our format here is Cindy and I both have some opening things that we would like to say, but it's not going to take that much of our 90 minute time. And then the rest of that time, I'd really like for it to be an opportunity for you to ask questions. And so when that time comes, then if you look, if you hold your cursor down to that lower left hand corner of your screen, you should see uh, the mute button and that mute and unmutes you. Perfect, thank you. And also while you're hovering down there, you'll see the option for chat. You can chat to everyone or you can chat to a specific individual on the call. I'm gonna go ahead and try to keep an eye on that so that um, Jim doesn't have to manage too much of that. So certainly if you need to get my attention, that's a great way to do it. And uh, this session is being recorded so um, that we can continue to, to put that on the website for other folks that weren't able to register. All right, Jim, are you ready for your introduction? I am ready to go. You can shorten it up. All you... right. So we are very pleased to have Dr. Jim Broyles, the Director of Professional Affairs for the Ohio Psychological Association tonight. He's been a psychologist in private practice since 1990. Dr. Broyles received his doctorate from The Ohio State University and is a past president of OPA. <laughs> Currently, he is the Director of Professional Affairs for OPA, as well as a member of several committees. 
He specializes in working with children, families, and individual adults on a variety of issues, including depression, anxiety, couples and relationship issues, family conflict, parenting challenges, and divorce issues. Dr. Broyles also specializes in practicing hypnotherapy, a tool used in helping individuals release past traumas, move past long-standing negative patterns, and overcome negative habits. So welcome, Dr. Broyles. And now I will introduce myself very briefly. Uh, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm Cindy Van Curen. I'm president-elect. I received my doctorate in clinical psychology at Xavier University in 2003. Uh, I then went on to do my pre-doctoral internship at the Cleveland VA in 2003, and then went on to do a two-year residency in chronic pain re rehabilitation at the Cleveland Clinic. Worked at the VA for 15 years, where I was one of the first providers to implement telehealth as a routine element of care. So I'm happy to talk with you about my experience of navigating some of the problems back then, um, and if I can save you some of that frustration. And uh, I left the VA in January. I now work at the Cleveland Clinic for the Neurologic Institute. My primary interests are chronic pain management, adapting and coping with disability, headache management, and program development. And with that, I'll turn the floor over to Jim. Okay, and we should let people know too that we're recording this because we thought it would be a really good idea to get a recording of some of your questions and answers and then post that on our website because that might help other people, uh, you know, calm some of their concerns and worries and might answer some of their um, questions. So. Part of what I want to do is I just want to just say uh, some just general ideas of, you know, uh, things that I've been learning, things that I've been coming to understand, and the inf and basics of some of the information that I want to get out to you. I want, and then Cindy's going to talk to us a little bit about some specifics with uh, teletherapy and telepsychology, and I really need her here because I truly am not an expert in that area. And so it's so helpful for her to have, you know, that, uh, for her to be here to give us some, just some backup. Uh, give me some backup on, you know, some of the questions that you might have in the practice of uh, teletherapy. So um, if we're just, part of what I want to cover here is just to help give you an update of this very quickly changing circumstances that we're in right now um, that are affecting all of our practices, okay? So uh, I want to give you like an uh, overview, of the changes, overview of the changes, and a good, uh, good thing to really keep in mind is that there's so many different levels of laws and of regulations that are affecting us. So we have like state level laws, federal level laws, stuff that comes from the Board of Psychology, our Board of Psychology, uh, the, and then the regulations that come from the insurance company and they interact with each other. So it's almost like when one little piece gets changed, it's affecting everything else. And some of the outcome of that is that, you know, unfortunately there are not in some areas, some really definitive answers. So um, in many cases, when these changes occur, it takes, you know, attorneys and professional associations a long time of looking at them to give you some defin definitive guidance. And we don't have that time right now. We're all just really scrambling, uh, trying to keep up with everything that's going on. So the, in addition to that, I guess I'd like to say that um, what I am noticing among all these different entities, government energy entities, uh, uh, you know, get professional association, all of you, insurance uh, entity, that there's a real attitude of mutual support and uh, sort of compassion and forgiveness as we keep moving through all of this. And I, I really am hoping that, to keep that up. I've seen insurance companies really scrambling to try and, you know, sort through their regulations uh, and get, uh, you know, get some updates on some of the things that they're doing so that we can get the best possible help out to people. And I've got my fingers crossed. I'm really hoping that that, uh, continues. Uh, I'm making the best effort that I have to keep up with all of this, uh, to understand everything that's happening. Got a lot of good resources, got a lot of channels of information coming into me. I stay tuned into APA. I have other directors of professional affairs uh, in net, that I'm in network with across the country. Uh, I've got some pretty good contacts with the insurance companies, not all of them, but uh, you know, many of them. Uh, I'm, I'm in continual communication with Ron Ross, who's the director of our, uh, executive director of our Board of Psychology, and we're all trying to exchange information with each other. So, um, you know, I, I'm bringing all this information in um, and trying to get it out to you. I try to vet the information and get it out to you as clearly as I can. Um, 
Another thing I guess that I want to make sure that, that to be able to point out is really all of our current board rules of psychology are continued to be in place. So that none of these changes in the law or changes that we're seeing, emergency rules and regulations, uh, are really changing any of the requirements that are there for us coming to us from the Board of Psychology. Um, and so um, uh, the one exception to that is that uh, today there was a, an emergency order passed allowing uh, psychologists from other states to get emergency temporary licensure here in Ohio in case they have clients, these people, these psychologists from other states have clients here who are quarantined here in Ohio that they need to be able to communicate with. And of course they can't if they're not licensed in Ohio. So many of the states are doing this right now. We're connecting with one another. A lot of the states are uh, passing emergency rules allowing temporary licensure in those states. And so if you are a psychologist who's trying to reach out to you know, uh, a client who's in the neighboring state, you know, check the uh, uh, you know, board rules in that state because many of them are allowing for emergency licensure in that state. Um, if you look at the updates that I am sending out, the most recent one that I sent out today, which was uh, posted on uh, uh, the listserv a little bit ago, it was blast emailed out to um, uh, every all psychologists in Ohio, and it will be posted on our website. That gives a link to the webpage uh, at ASPPD uh, that's, that's, that's doing a summary. They're, they've got a running summary of those states that have emergency licensing regulations with some links to that website to, to talk to you about how to get connected with that Board of Psychology to get a, a temporary license if you need to do that. Um, the Federal Office of Civil Rights and the Department of Health and Human Services enforces HIPAA, okay? And they came out with a statement last week that I will just go ahead and read directly to you. During the COVID-19 national emergency, which also constitutes a nationwide public health emergency, covered health care providers subject to HIPAA rules may seek to communicate with patients and provide telehealth services through remote communication technologies. Some of these technologies and the manner in which they are used by HIPAA covered health care providers may not fully comply with the requirements of the HIPAA rules. OCR, the Office of Civil Rights, will exercise its enforcement discretion and will not impose penalties for non-compliance with the regulatory requirements under HIPAA rules against covered health care providers in connection with a good faith provision of telehealth during COVID-19 nationwide public health emergency. This notifica notification is in effect immediately. And again, that came out last week. So, you know, I'm in communication with our attorneys from APA, and one of the things that they're saying to us is basically this, how this translates to our everyday work is this. If you make a, if, if you're attempting to uh, connect with one of your clients uh, via, uh, and provide teletherapy, and you make that really good faith effort to find a web-based platform um, that is, you know, HIPAA compliant, and, the, and it is not available, and you can't access that, then, then connecting with your client is the highest priority and moving forward to using something that isn't necessarily HIPAA compliant is your next step. And they're saying that, 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 that that's an okay thing for you to do. Now, and maybe Cindy will talk, well, Cindy's gonna talk a little bit about uh, uh, you know, uh, providing teletherapy. One of the things that we have to keep in mind is that providing teletherapy is still considered to be a specialty uh, area by our board. And so that has not changed. None of those board rules have changed. And what the, what the uh, in general, what those rules say is that you need to have some training and some background in teletherapy in order to start moving into this area. However, our board doesn't really specify, you know, what that training should cover. And so what I did in one of my earlier uh, updates was uh, I, I gave you the just basic guidelines of the important areas that teletherapy training should cover to bring you up to speed with that. And Cindy might talk about that here in a little bit. Um, in general, Insurance companies right now really are scrambling to the, revise their policies. And I'm seeing stuff, you know, come through every day. And so in my updates that I'm giving you, I've seen revisions in policies so far from Optum, Aetna, Cigna, uh, 
uh, Ohio uh, Medicaid, from Medicare, um, I'm probably leaving some out, uh, but many, many of these have updated their policies. And the, with the private insurance companies, part of what we are, say, we are seeing is that um, th they uh, um, have had more stringent requirements that include things like, hey, you have to go to our website and attest that you are a trained telehealth provider, or you need to use our specific web-based platform if you're going to provide uh, uh, teletherapy. Uh, as to any of our insureds. So th those are the kinds of things that they're dropping. Another thing that I see them dropping is this requirement that it be both visual and audio connection. So in other words, even though the definition of telemedicine or uh, telehealth or teletherapy is, is much broader in many cases, most insurance companies are actually requiring that you know that the provision of services be both visual and audio that's their typical regulation and i'm seeing that being dropped by many many of them many many of them are saying right now you know if it's audio only which would include phone contact if that's the way that you have to reach out to your client then you then again connecting with your client is highest priority okay and again if you go back through uh, some of the updates that I'm giving you, I'm giving you specifics that I'm getting from policies that they send to me, and I'm posting them there, okay? Um, Medicare, right now, uh, typically Medicare has also updated its policies. Uh, there's some good things there and some bad things. The good part of it is Medicare's uh, uh, rule about providing uh, teletherapy has been very strict. So in other words, um, what, what their typical rule, the, the typical rule to typical law actually has been that a Medicare recipient can only receive teletherapy if they live in certain geographically remote rural locations. And even then they must go to their doctor's office in order to receive that service. Now that's been dropped. Those that, that the uh, guidelines have been loosened up and they are saying that we can provide uh, teletherapy services to them directly in their home, regardless of where they live. So that's the good part. Now here's the bad part, that they're still sticking with their rule that it must be visual and audio. And that's bad news really for many of our Medicare recipients. Many of our Medicare recipients are older, okay? They don't have access to technology that sometimes other people do. And uh, that leaves them stranded still. So there has been a very strong push here over the last you know, uh, week or so uh, to get Medicare to adapt those guidelines also. And uh, at, I can tell you that right now, APA and NASW and DC have signed a joint letter to Medicare asking them to change that requirement. Um, I know many of our members are currently contacting their, their members of Congress, urging them to make a change to push forward with all of this, to have the understanding of all of this. And so, you know, that might be, a, if you're re really concerned about this issue, issue, that might be a good way of, you know, going about doing that. I believe that you all received with your um, invite to be a part of this, I think there was a handout that was attached to that email. And uh, that handout, I believe, should have my email address and then uh, a link to my all of my updates that I've been sending out and then a, a link also to our resource page. So I'm hoping you have that and that's a good way of getting more specific details about all the insurance companies that I'm talking about. When we have our questions and answers. If you want to ask specific questions about companies, I'll do that here too. So that's the basic thing that I want to um, uh, get out to you and I'll let Cindy do her spiel. Thank you, Jim. Actually, before I go into my spiel, I want to go ahead and respond to the question posed by Melissa, because I know this has come up on the listserv recently. Uh, and for those of you who can't see the chat box, Melissa's question is what address to use as the site address for telehealth. Uh, she wants to avoid using her home address. I remember Dave Schwartz chimed in about BWC's policy. They're allowing sort of a central address during this time. Um, I'm wondering if uh, Jim or, or Michael, if you know what is being used or what we're recommending be used um, during this time for an well, address. It, this, this kind of points out some of the difficulty that we're having because when you go into the question of should 
you know, then the answer is from whose perspective? Are we, this sounds like it might be an insurance company regulation question, okay? And so um, the, uh, uh, you know, in some insurance companies may have that stipulated that, hey, this is your, this is the, this is what should be defined as your uh, uh, site address. I don't know if that's exactly right, but what should be defined as your office or the place of, you know, emerging service where your service is coming from. Um, I, I know that uh, uh, Medicaid, just as a part of their rules uh, that just came out, the revised rules uh, defined that. And in just a minute, I'll go back and I'll look that up. Uh, I, I can't tell you right now what, what Medicare's rule is. That's probably important. Uh, my bet would be just to be on the safe side, it should probably be your office. They may not define it. I'm not sure I'm aware of any other regulation from another insurance company that's being real specific about that. I, 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 what I suspect is they probably are not. But here's the most important part of it. There, when, you're, when you're billing for a teletherapy service, there is a place on your billing that actually has... Um, a code for the, 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 I can't remember now what it's called, the place of origin from your, for your, um, uh, for, for the services. And that should be defined as O2. And what that's telling them, what's that signaling them is that it's a teletherapy session. It's just a general code uh, that allows it to be, to be defined as a, a, a teletherapy session. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Marjorie's question is uh, much is more my turf, so I'm going to go ahead and just kind of give you a little bit of background on my experience with uh, telemedicine. Uh, as I mentioned, I was one of the first Cleveland VA providers to offer it, so I was kind of, and I'm also very conscientious and uh, ultra nerdy, so I really wanted to have policies, procedures, safety planning. I worked very, very hard to make sure those things were in place before I needed them. Uh, so I, so that's something that I'm very thoughtful about, would be very happy to address questions. Um, there's, there's no emergency I didn't encounter in my 10 years of doing very routine telehealth. Uh, my schedule was converted, so I did telehealth three days a week out of a five-day work week, so I was seeing more patients by telehealth. So I can even give you some tips on scheduling if you decide to go forward with this when it isn't uh, your only medium for contacting patients. Um, I definitely want to give you some tips on checking your environment. One of my favorite stories, uh, I was in my office at work and I had a little bookcase behind me and I had little five hour energies lined up. It was just a bad week. And I, I just love as I was assessing my patient that he said, so Dr. Van Curen, let's talk about your caffeine addiction. So patients learn a lot about us. And if you are doing telehealth from a home office, it just reveals a lot of information. For example, I would like to meet Colleen's cat that we just saw. So, so really being very sensitive to that and conversely being sensitive to the patient's environment because they don't always think about these things. Uh, and they may very well be talking to you about a trauma or marital discord or something else and the kids are playing on the floor next to them. So kind of talking with them about who's in the room, what they should be sensitive to, uh, helping them understand what's age appropriate if there's kids around. Uh, and I'd love to give you tips because the, the biggest challenge I had, and I know a lot of other people had, is, you know, how do I establish rapport with someone who isn't sitting in the room with me? You know, we know all of our good visual cues and looking at body language and so forth. Uh, so I'd, I'd love to give you some tips on that. For my own comfort in the beginning, I required that every patient meet me in person the first time, and then we would decide together to proceed with telehealth. It was actually the patients who made me change my mind because then they'd go on to telehealth and say, well, couldn't we have just always done it this way? So the patients, for them, it didn't matter. Um, and there's some, again, some tips and tricks that I can, can share with you about making that rapport a little bit more comfortable for both of you, mostly just by acknowledging that it's uncomfortable for both of you. That usually works out okay. Um, the only downside that I've encountered in all these years, even with very amazing, well pixelated technology, is I miss the silent tears. And that can be a problem. 
Um, you know, if you've got a patient who's tearful but prideful and not wanting to tell you that, I, you can't, I, I can't see that. So what I've done is I sort of build in a pause before I respond to a patient for anything uh, so that I can ca catch those little hiccups, the, the shallow breathing, catch anything like that um, that might give me some other indicators. Um, and just to tell you a little bit more about some of the, the information I can share with you is I've been involved with the Communications and Technology Committee for many, many years. Um, and I just stepped down as the chair this past uh, September. So I've been involved with the competencies. Uh, for those of you who uh, took advantage of OPA's webinar, that's me. Um, so I, I can certainly speak to what OPA's expectations are, back to Marjorie's question, um, about what, what looks like competency to us, what we're looking for to make sure that you and your patients are comfortable and um, you know, what options you might have for getting additional training or support. As I mentioned, we, we're trying very hard to pull together a support group or a supervision group by early next week. All right, so with that, uh, is that I think we can, can open I, the floor. Oh let me, let me make a couple comments here. Uh, I'm looking at some of the questions over here. First of all, um, the code I was trying to think, the, the word I was trying to think of before was place of service. So just remember that when you're billing a teletherapy session, if you're familiar at all with the way billing works and that sort of standard HICFA form, there's even electronic version of it, uh, that, 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 that is mostly what the insurance company is going to look at when they see you billing one of these sessions. And if you look at the bottom of the HICFA form, there's an actual line there that, that has date of service, a CPT code, place of service, okay, and then modifiers. And there's some other stuff on there too. Some of those things we usually leave blank because they're not relevant for us. So place of service or POS as, as Mary is pointing out here, place of service is zero two. That's signaling them that it's a teletherapy session. And then that modifier is either GT or 95. Uh, and that, go that all goes together on one line. That's signaling them that it's a teletherapy session. Um, I want to go back here and capture this other question here, too. My main question, this is from Marjorie. My main question is, given the board's requirements to conduct teletherapy have not changed, what is the best way to get up and running to provide teletherapy? Do we need supervision? How many CEUs? Thanks. So first of all, I want to say, right now, there might not be a best way. Okay? And this is one of those areas where it's going to be very difficult to give you a really definitive answer. So I guess I wanna answer this question in, in a couple of different ways. One is just remember, if anything that you are doing right now is ever called into question by the board, they simply review the circumstances on a case by case basis. And one of the, the, one of the things that they would take into account are these current circumstances. And they're gonna be looking for, have you made a good faith effort? to really get, some, get up to speed with all of this? Is the training that you got covering some of those main areas that I sent out to people, you know, that's in our guidelines? And, uh, you know, have you, have you done, have you, have you got up to speed on those things before you just leap right into this? Those are the kinds of things that they're gonna be looking at. And they're saying the most important thing is that, you're, that you think about the well-being of your client. That is your highest priority. There isn't like a standard CEU requirement. There isn't like a requirement of certain, you know, a certain number of hours of supervised supervision. There isn't any of that from the board's perspective. Okay, if you have that and you've got a certificate that shows that, that's great. And I know that's vague, but it's the best answer I can give you. Right. And, and if I can add to that as well, uh, you know, there is an informed consent form that OPA has posted on their website for telepsychology. I'd encourage you to, to take a look at that and make sure that you're, you're using that. And it kind of explains the potential risks and downfalls of conversing through telepsychology. Um, as a, this, I'm saying this as just sort of a professional, not a representative of OPA, but I've encouraged some of my friends who've reached out and haven't done the trainings to include a statement to that effect as well. 
that under the circumstances, this is being provided, though I've not completed the full training and will do so, you know, as soon as it's available, something to that effect right. as well. Good effort to do that. Yeah. Um, so again, more questions about these codes and they are, it's just really uh, technical. Uh, and so I did leave this out. Your CPT code that you're using is the same CPT code that you always use. If you look at the definitions of the CTP code, all of those definitions still apply and they are all time based. So it's face to face individual therapy, family therapy, whatever. And it's the same CPT code that you would typically be using with the addition of that a place of service and modifier. There's another question here, um, here about, uh, they're not, someone's not clear about the address to use. Melissa, can you just ask me the question that you're asking? Yeah, sure. I'm happy to do that. I've been getting some uh, mixed responses from different payers about what physical location we're supposed to use. There's the billing address and then there's the physical site address. I talked to a representative from TriWest today, which manages the TRICARE uh, policies. Right. And she told me, use your office address. Even though you're at home delivering the service, use the office address. Because what's gonna happen there, and again, this is one of those things, unfortunately, there's not a really definitive answer to, but if you use something that they don't already have in their system, it's gonna bounce. Do you right, but okay? that's what I thought, but I've heard from other payers who said, no, you have to list the physical address of where you are. Yeah, and so each one could have a different regulation about that, and that part I'm not familiar with, but I'm right. worried about, though, even though you got somebody on the phone who's telling you you have to use the physical address of where you are, they may uh -huh. not understand the nuances of their system, and so if you suddenly throw an address at them that they don't have in their system, I'm worried that that's going to throw things off, even though that rep's saying that to you on the phone. So you think I should just use the office address? Um, I think that as long as you are clearly designating when you're sending in the bill that this is a teletherapy session, right. I think you're covering yourself. If anybody okay. ever comes back to you and says, hey, what the heck was going on here? When you build this, then you could, you're showing it was, an on, it was a web-based session. And that was okay. the most important thing for them to know. That brings up another point here that I want to uh, bring up. This is all changing so quickly that at the higher levels of the insurance company, their policymakers are getting together and they're making some new decisions about what's okay and what's not okay, and it's not trickling down. So in other words, first of all, you can't even get a phone rep on the phone. You, you wait forever on hold because everybody's calling right now. And even if you do get them on the phone, I'm hearing answers that are different than what their policymakers are telling me. When that tells me that their telephone reps are not being trained, have not been trained, who's huh. surprised by that, right? Yeah. I mean, because when we have ongoing, po when they have, uh, you know, policies that have been in existence for six months or a year, sometimes those telephone reps aren't up to speed with that. So I, I would be really cautious. There's going to be a lot of confusion because these guys are not up to speed with all of that. And I would take that into account too. Okay. That's helpful. Um, any, uh, let's take some other questions. Then Mary Lewis responded to Catherine's question, which I appreciate. Um, Catherine's looking for specific sources of telepsychology telepsychology training that are not limited to OPA. Um, and I have noticed some folks posting those, uh, especially ones that are free, discounted, um, but are credible. They've been posting that on the listserv, so please be sure to check that. And we can put that in our FAQs as well. Um, Mary posted one here that she's um, able to personally endorse the eight hour one from APA that they sent out recently that is currently free. Um, it covers the ethical issues, technical issues, and um, just basic things to pay attention to. So that would certainly be very comprehensive. Cindy, can you check? I haven't looked, um, but can you check on our resource page to see that if we're if we're actually posting some res you know training resources? Uh, I, I think will. we are, but I haven't looked at that I real closely. And then maybe we can okay. keep on posting things there. There's a question here about. 95 in GT, and what's the difference? You got me, okay? And what I'm saying, and every, every resource that I have says use either this one or that one. These coding things have been around for a long time and they tend not to change. And what I would say is use one, and if it doesn't work, use the other one. Other questions?
Catherine, can you uh, unmute? If you want to ask a question, you need to, you need to unmute. Oh, sorry, I was looking yeah. at the button to unmute. So anyway, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I was wondering, I've seen some things posted about a telephonic session and that being um, okay. In general, if we're, I'm an out of network provider. So if I were to see someone over a telephone call and would it be appropriate at this time to bill that as a regular CPT code 90834 to 95 and it was telephonic the entire time? So uh, when you say bill it, do you as an out of, out of network person, are you bill, are you sending in bills? No, I send um, clients who wish to submit for insurance, I send them a super bill. So yeah, the, yeah. yeah. So, so I would go ahead and keep it, if you have, do you have access to any of this information that I've been sending out about specifics from the companies? Have you seen any? Of my I've, looked at what, I've looked at what you posted. I may have missed a few. I think earlier this week you said something about um, UBH accepting telephonic. I'm not sure if any other companies UBH, have. have Anthem, uh, Medicare emergency rules are, are allowing for telephone okay. right now at this point. Of course, you can't do Medicaid, uh, but unless you're a Medicaid provider. Um, and then, um, uh, let's see, uh, Cigna today. All of those just have, have, have passed some emergency rules that allow for telephone only, audio only sessions. Now these are temporary. With these ones that are going okay. to audio only, they're temporary. And what I've seen, I think like 90 days or something like that. But in that circumstance, you're talking to somebody on the phone, you're providing a session on the phone, then I would go ahead and give them that receipt or that pick of a form or whatever you do that just says this is a legitimate thing and you've coded it, you put it in your records and they can they can submit that for reimbursement. Okay, but on my end as a um, provider, once I send, send them their insurance receipt, I don't have control over that. So I can write in my note whether or not it is a um, video conference or a phone, but basically yep. with the 95 modifier, I'm just, it's okay to just send that out, whether it was telephone or video. At yeah, this and that place of service zero two thing. also, both yes. does. That's a Thank valid you. thing, correct. That's very helpful. Uh, just I did comment, just check Jim. and on, on the OPA website, there are, there's a listing of telehealth continuing education opportunities. Um, so there's a, a several listed from PESI, APA, uh, the Telebehavioral Health Institute. Uh, Mary Lewis just shared one with me privately. I'll double check and see, see if that's on there. If not, we can add that. And I wanted to respond to the question about email counting as telepsych. So it does in terms of competencies and um, uh, the information that you can find on the communications and technology site. Um, but in terms of billable service, I, I don't believe that's the case, but I'll defer to Jim. I'm sorry, I was reading the comments. Ask me so the there one, th someone's asking if email counts as telepsychology, and it does in the sense of uh, sort of a protected privilege and competencies, um, but no. I don't think it counts in terms of no. billing. Does billable, not. No, um, that's not no. something you could bill for, correct, right. Mm -hmm. uh, Michael, did you have, I, I, thought, I thought I heard you say Yeah, I, I would like to let people know that today a, a bill was introduced in the Ohio House to require all insurance companies that operate in Ohio to pay for telehealth. House Bill 580. So um, if, you, if you want to reach out to your state rep and urge them to support that, probably be a good idea. Right. There's a danger here. So that that was that bill says that they are required to reimburse equivalent to um, uh, they're they're required to we're equivalent to face to face, right? Right. So, um, I, and I saw a um, bulletin coming from the state uh, Department of Insurance that went out to the insurance companies, asking them to uh, provide equivalent services on the equivalent base, same equivalent basis. It was very loosely worded, but my contact that I'm connecting with. On, on uh, with the Ohio Department of Insurance, I asked her that question very specifically today. I said, our biggest concern right now is that insurance companies might try to sneak in the back door and use their lower reimbursement rates. Some of them have lower re reimbursement rates 
for teletherapy. And uh, we just really see this as a way of them making money during the crisis. So I'm hoping that's tuning them into that a little bit more too. I hope to hear back from her. I will say a couple of them have affirmed that the reimbursement rates will be equivalent. And I believe United Healthcare was one of them. So some of them are telling me that. If you go, again, go, if you go back and look for my updates, there are actual links to specific policies where you can read that in more detail. Uh, going to another question from Marissa, where she's uh, asking about Google Voice that's been recommended for learners who do not have a, a, a phone issued by their agency and whether or not that is HIPAA compliant and safe to use. And Melissa responded with ATA approved HIPAA compliant and encrypted phone systems. And she's got included on that list Google Voice if upgraded to G Suite. So I'll just kind of open that to Melissa and Marissa. Does that kind of satisfy? That, that question? Yeah, I was looking for specifically something um, free or, <laughs> yeah, free. So I don't know if any of those have a cost with them, but I, I certainly appreciate the recommendations and I'll look into it. Again, Marissa, if you are making a good faith effort to use something that is HIPAA compliant, okay? Remember that HIPAA is being enforced by the Office of Civil Rights, uh, you know, the uh, Health of Human Ser Department of Health and Human Services, and they've come forward and say, if anybody ever tries to point the finger at you during this time of crisis, saying that you were using something that was not HIPAA compliant, then you just demonstrate that you made a very good faith effort uh, to find something that was HIPAA compliant, and that was simply not accessible to you. Frankly, I think that they will, they would, they would, they wouldn't go that far into any 